The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity. Patient stories from the HCC Casebook. Expert guidance on optimizing outcomes and care with newly available and emerging therapies. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash VBH860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello, and welcome to Patient Stories from the HCC Casebook, Expert Guidance on Optimizing Outcomes and Care with Newly Available and Emergent Therapies. I'm Dr. Richard Finn from the Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA, and I'm joined today by Dr. Laura Kulik from Northwestern University and Katie, Dr. Katie Kelly from UCSF. In this activity, we'll be opening up the HCC Casebook and exploring a collection of patient case stories that detail critical clinical decision points along the HCC disease spectrum. Each casebook will be paired with a presentation explaining the clinical evidence that supports optimal therapeutic strategies. Today's agenda will include three patient casebooks. Casebook 1, Optimizing Treatment Selection for Newly Diagnosed Patients with Advanced HCC by myself. Casebook 2, Enhancing Sequencing Strategies with Second-Line Targeted Agents, Immunotherapy and Combinations by Dr. Katie Kelly and Casebook 3, Improving Outcomes with Emerging Strategies Across the HCC Continuum by Dr. Laura Kolek. Let's get started with Casebook 1, Optimizing Treatment Selection for Newly Diagnosed Patients with Advanced Liver Cancer. As you know, we have made great progress in treating many malignancies in the United States and worldwide. Interestingly, of the malignancies that is actually increasing in mortality is liver cancer. And as you know, liver cancer really represents two diseases. It represents chronic liver disease and a malignancy. And it's important that when we approach our patients that we work as a multidisciplinary team to optimize patient care. Here is our first case. We have a 62-year-old lady with non-alcoholic steatohepatitis NASH, or fatty liver disease, is a rising uh, cause of liver cancer. Globally, we know that hepatitis C and hepatitis B remain major causes. But as our treatments for hepatitis C get better, we still expect an increase in liver cancer incidence from NASH. This patient presents with well-compensated liver disease, as represented by being child Pew A. And her AFP is mildly elevated at 134. She has no, no ascites or encephalopathy, and she has a very good performance status, performance status zero. However, when she's imaged, she's found to have multifocal liver cancer. Using imaging criteria, this is called LIRADS-5 or LR5, which means that a biopsy would not be needed to make this diagnosis in a patient with underlying liver disease. She has four lesions, the largest measuring 5.6 centimeters, with invasion into the right portal vein. So now we need to think about what are our treatment options, but I think first it's important to consider what stage is this patient. Liver cancer is typically staged using the Barcelona system or the BCLC, and this patient has criteria that qualifies her to have advanced liver cancer. Most specifically is that she has invasion into the portal vein or what we call macrovascular invasion. If she did not have that criteria, if she did not have invasion into the portal vein, she may be considered to be intermediate or Barcelona B and may be a candidate for local regional treatments. But once we see invasion of the portal vein, that is a sign of more advanced disease. So historically, the backbone of treatment for patients with Barcelona C or advanced liver cancer has been small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Serafinib was approved initially in 2008 and has pretty much stood the test of time until fairly recently. It was shown in a placebo-controlled study to improve survival by a median of about three months versus placebo, and that translated into a hazard ratio of 0.69. A few years back, we saw the approval of linvantinib, another very potent VEGF receptor multikinase inhibitor, which differs from serafinib a little bit in its uh, target profile, and in a large phase 3 study was compared to serafinib, and while it was not superior for the primary endpoint of overall survival, it did meet the non-inferiority endpoint with a hazard ratio of 0.92. And importantly, the upper limit of the confidence 
confidence interval for that data demonstrated non-inferiority. However, we did see that the survival for lenvantinib in that study was 13.6 months versus 12.3 months for serafinib. And as we've seen in other modern studies, randomized studies, is that survival with serafinib has been improving. Importantly, the lenvantinib study excluded patients who had portal vein invasion outside the liver. So as you know, there's the main portal vein that then branches into the right and left portal veins. And in the Lenvantinib study, they excluded those patients who had portal vein invasion outside the liver. Nevertheless, in the REFLEX study, Lenvantinib was superior to serafinib when we looked at progression-free survival or response rates. On this slide, we're comparing those response data, whether looking at the modified resist criteria, which takes into account the size of the enhancing component of liver tumors, or the more conventional resist criteria that looks like looks at the sum of the longest diameter, we can see that response rates were with lenvantinib were higher. 12.4% versus about 41% using modified resists, or 6.5% versus just under 19% with lenvantinib. So for a long time, we've been able to improve survival in liver cancer without inducing significant objective responses. However, with the approval of lenvantinib, we now had another option, a small molecule that actually had a higher response rate, whether by resist or modified resist. And the side effect profile for lenvantinib and serafinib are interesting in that there is clearly some overlap. Both drugs cause hypertension because of their VEGF receptor component, but this is more of an issue with lenvantinib, uh, higher overall incidence and higher grade 3, 4 incidence. Whereas with serafinib, there was a higher incidence and intensity of hand-foot skin syndrome, which was not as much of an issue with lenvantinib. Still, both drugs called, cause GI toxicity, such as anorexia, weight loss, and diarrhea. And again, referring to the VEGF receptor component of lenvantinib, a higher frequency of proteinuria. Now, there's been a lot of interest in immunotherapy and cancer medicine, right? These drugs have really revolutionized almost every malignancy we treat in some way or another. And in liver cancer, there's been interest in these drugs for several years now. Now, single agent data with the PD-1 or pd one inhibitors has been very interesting, and they have accelerated approval in the second line setting, and uh, Dr. Kelly will speak to that. However, there's been interest in trying to improve response rates by combining checkpoint inhibitors with other agents, specifically either the VEGF receptor kinase inhibitors or monoclonal antibodies. Recent data with the combination with bevacizumab and atezolizumab has shown very impressive efficacy in liver cancer, and the rationale for that really revolves around the effects of bevacizumab in changing the immune microenvironment to make tumors more sensitive to the T-cell activation effects of atezolizumab. I think our thinking about the role of VEGF in cancer has changed over time, initially from the idea that using drugs like bevacizumab really are just starving a tumor of of, uh, a blood supply, has evolved to the idea that bevacizumab's effect on VEGF and modeling the intratumoral vasculature really changes many aspects that could make a tumor more sensitive to the effects of a drug like atezolizumab. This idea was validated in the phase 3 I am Brave 150 trial, which looked at atezolizumab and bevacizumab versus arafenib in untreated patients with advanced liver cancer. This study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in May of this year, of 2020, and recently got FDA approval. This study randomized patients two to one between the combination of atezo and bev versus serafinib and used pretty typical inclusion criteria for advanced liver cancer studies, specifically looking at patients who had advanced disease, good performance status, and uh, preserved organ function and preserved liver function as measured by the child Pew score. Importantly, because of concerns about bevacizumab's uh, effect on the vasculature and its association with bleeding, Patients were required to have an upper endoscopy within six months of coming on study. And this will be important to keep in mind as this combination gets used in the community. 
This was really a hallmark study. This was the first time that we've seen something beat serafinib. It had two primary endpoints, one progression-free survival, the other overall survival. And it met both these endpoints with a hazard ratio for overall survival of 0.58. And interesting, a very similar uh, hazard ratio for progression-free survival of 0.59. What this study, I think, is teaching us is that when you have a combination that really can significantly improve PFS with a hazard ratio that's significantly low, here less than 0.6, that this will translate into an overall survival advantage. The median survival at the time of the analysis uh, for serafinib was 13.2 months, but we still have not reached the median survival in the combination arm of Atezo and Bev. Underlying this improvement in PFS and OS is a very striking response rate. We are now seeing responses by conventional resist here with this combination confirmed by independent review of 27%. This is very striking for us, especially being in the liver cancer space for so long and having drugs that we knew improved survival, which is ultimately the most important endpoint, but never really induced significant responses. And now we have a combination that is not only improving survival, but in a fair number of patients, we can tell them your tumors are actually getting smaller. And presumably that will have a positive effect on any symptoms and quality of life endpoints. Now, it's important to balance any of these uh, efficacy measures by uh, side effects. And here you can see comparing side effects of the combination versus serafinib with the lighter bars representing all grade adverse events, the darker bars higher grade events. And you can see that pretty much uh, the toxicity is greater in the serafinib arm than in the atezolizumab and bevacizumab arm with a few exceptions, one being hypertension, which again uh, is related to the VEGF component of bevacizumab, as well as proteinuria and infusion reactions. Quality of life data from this study actually significantly favors uh, the combination as well. There was a slight increase in bleeding events with uh, atezolizumab and bevacizumab. However, uh, these are minimized in this patient population by screening endoscopies. Now, there's been other interest in immunotherapy agents in liver cancer. Nivolumab, which is approved in the second line, was looked at in the frontline study, the Checkmate 459, which looked at nivolumab versus serafinib. And this study, unfortunately, did not meet its uh, primary endpoint of improving overall survival. Interestingly, it provided a median survival of 16 months in the nivolumab arm, and the response rate with nivolumab in this study was very similar to what we saw in uh, phase two studies, and that's in the 15 to 20% range. Uh, nivolumab was certainly favored based on toxicity. And actually, even though uh, this study did not meet its primary endpoint, it is listed in the NCCN guidelines as a first-line option for those patients who are ineligible for TKI or other anti-angiogenic agents, though this recommendation is category 2B. Now, let's come to our case again. So this patient is well compensated. Uh, she has no ascites, uh, good performance status, and advanced liver cancer. As we sit here today, there are three uh, regimens that are FDA approved for this indication, atezolizumab and bevacizumab, single agent lenvantinib, or serafinib. Personally, I would say if this patient does not have uh, varices on an endoscopy, then this patient would be an excellent candidate for the newly approved atezolizumab and bevacizumab regimen given it is the one that has been shown to actually improve survival versus the other agents. Now, clinical trials, I still maintain, are the best option for our patients that qualify. It's important to keep in mind that the clinical trial population in liver cancer does not represent every patient with liver cancer we see, and therefore it's still important for patients who are good trial candidates that we refer them to trials to help keep improving outcomes for our patients. There's several trials that are ongoing. Some have completed accrual, but some are still uh, open to accrual. And many of these are combinations. Uh, the LEAP002 study and COSMIC312 are looking at 
tyrosine kinase inhibitors in combination with checkpoint inhibitors. And the Himalaya study and Checkmate 90W are looking at dual checkpoint inhibition. The data with uh, lenvantinib and pembrolizumab uh, from early phase studies is very exciting. The Keynote 524, or previously known as the 116 study, had data updated at ASCO uh, just recently. And this is a single arm study of over 100 patients of lenvantinib at its standard dosing in combination with pembrolizumab in a frontline cohort. This regimen does have an FDA breakthrough designation from the FDA. And what we saw at ASCO was this combination is giving response rates of about 36% by conventional resist uh, with a very high disease control rate and a progression-free survival that is uh, very significant looking at a PFS of uh, just over eight months or just under eight months with this combination. So that is a very long PFS. Uh, median OS is 22 months, but keep in mind that this is single arm phase two data. And as you see on this slide, we're waiting for the uh, randomized data to read out. This study has completed accrual, and this is LEN and Pembro versus LEN alone. At the same time, data with cabozantinib, which is the VEGF, MET, and Axel inhibitor that is approved in second line, is being compared to serafinib alone, cabozantinib alone, or the combination of cabo and atezo in a large phase three study. In looking at combination studies, uh, we have the study looking at tremi, lumimab, and durvalumab. Updated data from this large phase two study was presented by Dr. Kelly at ASCO, looking at various dosing strategies in over 300 patients. This regimen has an orphan drug designation and again is showing very significant response rates, uh, especially in the high dose combination arm with response rates of 24% uh, with tolerability. Grade three, four events with this combination was 35%, uh, but there were no grade five events and the discontinuation rate from adverse events was consistent with other regimens at around 11%. This regimen is now being looked at in the Himalaya trial. Uh, this study has completed accrual and is looking at durvalumab and tremilumumab versus serafinib. The 9DW trial is looking at nivolumab and ipilumumab versus serafinib or lenvantinib in the frontline setting. And we'll hear more about the data underlying this study from Dr. Kelly where nivolumab and ipilumumab is approved in the second line setting. So let's take some questions from the audience. It looks like we have a few questions here. So first one, can you offer lenvantinib or serafinib after possible progression from atezo and BEV? Are there any side effects we should be managing, anticipating when we change from IO to TKI? This is a very pertinent question. And as we make progress in cancer medicine, it really is a challenge to us to figure out how to interpret and incorporate data from earlier studies. Now that Atezo and Bev likely will become a frontline regimen for a large majority of patients, what do we do on progression? Well, clearly there is no high grade evidence of what to do next. Personally, I think I would start sequencing the data as we have. For example, Lenvantinib and Serafinib are approved as first line TKIs and therefore I would choose one of them. And then at progression, go to one of the second line approved agents. Now again, this is uh, my opinion on this, uh, though we can't say we have strong data, there is rationale to think that these drugs should maintain their activity, given that they're VEGF receptor kinase inhibitors and they hit other targets. As far as other toxicities, I don't think we have evidence that prior Tezobev amplifies or changes the expected toxicity profile from these two TKIs. At the same time, we now have another question that also comments on these uh, new data. That is, given positive results from different IO combinations, how do you foresee selecting among the three regimens? So I think uh, the question is, now that we have IO and VEGF approved, what do we do if we have IO and IO and IO and TKI? Uh, and this, this will be a great problem to have because it will mean that we have a lot of different options for our patients. We'll obviously try to make cross-comparison, cross-trial comparisons about efficacy, but 
that may be difficult because all of them appear to be fairly active. So maybe the discussion will be concentrated on side effects uh, and, and have that discussion with any individual patient. I don't know, Katie, uh, what are your thoughts on these two questions? Thanks, Rich. Uh, I think I agree with you on both fronts. While we really don't know exactly what the best sequence of therapies is after atezolizumab plus bevacizumab, I think it is rational to proceed with a first-line tyrosine kinase inhibitor, um, noting that there is uh, data in other tumor types for continued antiangiogenic efficacy after progression on bevacizumab. Um, we have data to this effect in colorectal cancer. So I think, um, again, all, th all else being equal with respect to no prohibitive toxicity or other consideration, I, I think linvatinib or serafinib are both appropriate um, agents to use after teslizumab and bevacizumab. Um, I think one also could consider cabozantinib, given that it had uh, its eligibility allowed for multiple prior therapies, up to two prior therapies after uh, serafinib, um, and thus also um, could be considered as a second or third line agent. For the second question, you know, in terms of how to choose between IO combinations, I think obviously we have a lot of data coming over the next few years, which will guide this this decision. But it is, as you as you said already, very nicely, it's a great problem to have, and like other tumor types, we'll be able to tailor our choice of therapy according to individual patient comorbidities, in particular their our perceived um, our perception of their susceptibility to particular toxicity, such as vascular disease or autoimmune disease or um, other risk of bleeding, for example, um, and potentially choose among the, the combinations based on their side effect profile in particular, in parallel with um, looking very carefully for subgroups that may benefit from one combination more than another as we get more and more data. You know, Laura, unlike Katie and I, who are medical oncologists, you're a hepatologist, uh, is there any certain side effect uh, from these newer combinations uh, that you pay particularly attention to? So as you've pointed out, you know, the atezolizumab, the biggest concern as a hepatologist we have is the risk of variceal bleeding. And while this was low in the, the trial that you presented, once this is in the community, the concern will be if people are as vigilant in screening patients prior to giving this medication. And if a patient has a variceal bleed, there's a 20% risk of mortality. And so if you're gaining any benefit from treating their cancer and then they have a variceal bleed, you likely are going to have to stop the medication. And so if you can prevent that up front, I think that that would be the, the way they did in the trial would be the, the best modality. And it's just going to be really educating outside physicians that they need to be seen and scoped prior. Um, in terms of lumbatinib as a hepatologist, I think one of my concerns has been, you know, it, the, it, it, it seems to have its efficacy as, has been proven, but the, the sarcopenia and the loss of appetite, um, can be quite striking in patients. So I think they really need to be pushed for, uh, support in terms, uh, from nutrition. Great. So with those thoughts, we'll go to Katie, who will bring us through some second line, uh, concepts. Thanks so much, Rich. Um, so the title of this section is Enhancing uh, Sequencing Strategies with Second-Line Targeted Agents, Immunotherapy, and Combinations. So first, we'll start with another case. Um, in this case, the patient is a 60-year-old Asian male with chronic hepatitis B virus on antiviral therapy with adequate suppression. The patient was found to have, on an MRI scan, an 8-centimeter enhancing right lobe liver tumor that was determined radiographically to be LIRADS5, as Rich alluded to, a, sort of a diagnostic criteria with arterial enhancement and portal venous washout consistent with hepatocellular carcinoma, and also had two satellite lesions and a new right branch portal vein tumor thrombus, which, again, recalling our, our Barcelona Clinic uh, liver cancer staging alger algorithm, um, qualifies as advanced HCC with macro vessel invasion. Um, the patient had preserved liver function, child PUA, was also very fit with ECOG performance score of zero and had a mildly elevated alpha fetoprotein level of 130 nanograms per milliliter. So at the time that this patient was uh, started on his first line of therapy, he received serafinib at standard starting dose of 400 milligrams twice a day. 
but uh, promptly required dose reductions first to 400 and then to 200 milligrams once daily due to persistent hand foot skin reaction. He did tolerate the 200 milligram once daily dose for about three months, but unfortunately uh, on his first scan after starting treatment showed uh, radiographic progression, leading to the question, what is his option for second line therapy? So here is a slide that shows a general summary of the types of treatments we have available in the second line currently. Um, and again, presuming that we start with a first line TKI, um, the, the choice of agents that with established data in the second line are the other tyrosine kinase inhibitors, cabozantinib and regorafenib, which are both multi-kinase inhibitors. There's also the option for an anti-angiogenic monoclonal antibody targeting the VEGF receptor 2 um, isoform, um, which is ramucirumab. As well as now uh, in the U.S., approved by the U.S. FDA, three different uh, checkpoint inhibitor-based regimens, nivolumab as monotherapy, pembrolizumab monotherapy, and the combination of nivolumab plus ipilimumab, which was recent granted, recently granted approval. So we'll take each of these in turn. Uh, first, the multi-kinase inhibitor regorafenib, which has a, a similar target profile as sorafenib, but greater potency. The data for regorafenib comes from the randomized phase three resource trial, in which regorafenib was compared to placebo in the strict second line setting. And here we can see that eligibility for this trial required patients with advanced HCC, um, not amenable to curative therapies, who had progressed during prior serafenib treatment. And a, an important point of eligibility was that patients were required to have tolerated prior serafenib at a dose of at least 400 milligrams per day for at least 20 of the past 28 days prior to enrollment. So really the, the trial was selecting for patients who had tolerated um, a moderate or intermediate dose of serafinib or standard dose serafinib. And this is an important selection criteria for the drug. Um, patients were randomized two to one to regorafenib 160 milligrams daily for three out of every four weeks versus matched placebo. And the primary endpoint was overall survival. And here we can see that regorafenib achieved a statistically significant benefit over placebo with respect to survival with median overall survival of 10.6 months versus 7.8 months has a ratio of 0.63. And principal toxicities for regorafenib were similar to what we see with serafenib, including hypertension, hand foot syndrome, and loose stools or diarrhea. Now turning to the second multi-kinase inhibitor with approval in this space by the US FDA, cabozantinib. Cabozantinib is another multi-kinase inhibitor as Rich alluded to earlier. Um, cabozantinib, in addition to targeting VEGF receptor two and three isoforms, as we uh, see from regorafenib and serafenib as well, has some unique targets, including MET, which has been implicated in anti-angiogenic resistance, as well as um, a family of kinases called um, the TAM family kinases, which may have an Im immunomodulatory role and potentially contribute to its role as a partner for immunotherapy, as uh, Rich alluded to in the first line setting where it's being studied in combination with the tezolizumab. So in the celestial trial, cabozantinib was compared to placebo in patients who had received uh, uh, prior serafinib. An important difference from the resource trial of regorafenib shown on the previous slide was that um, patients did not have to have received any particular dose or duration of prior serafinib, but merely had to have progressed on or failed prior serafinib. And patients could have received up to two prior therapies, so serafinib and up to one other therapy, leading to about a third of the patient population being treated in the third line setting, um, not just the st strict second line setting. Patients were again randomized two to one to cabozantinib versus a matched placebo with the primary endpoint of overall survival. And here again, we see that cabozantinib improved survival significantly over placebo with a median overall survival of 10.2 months by comparison with 8.0 months for placebo hazard ratio of um, 0.76. Secondary endpoints of progression-free survival were, were also significantly improved. And uh, again, the class toxicity was characteristic of a multi-kinase inhibitor, including hypertension and diarrhea. Now, when comparing cabozantinib and regorafenib, it's, it's very important to note that the, it, it, we cannot uh, do cross-trial comparisons without the caveats of the variability and heterogeneity of trial design and population, as well as the, the era of the trial, um, which can influence downstream therapy options. 
That said, um, cabozantinib and regorafenib trials did have similar patient populations, and in an effort to try to match those uh, variability in, in prognostic factors, we did conduct a matched adjusted indirect comparison, or referred to as a MAKE analysis, to try to uh, better assess the, the eff efficacy of cabozantinib and regorafenib in a strict second-line population. Again, recalling that cabozantinib included third-line patients, the celestial trial included third-line patients, not just second-line so when uh, taking just the second line patients on cabozantinib um, in the celestial trial, as well as uh, matching against the resource trial patients treated with regorafenib for key prognostic factors like baseline alpha feta protein, as well as um, stage of disease and presence of macrovessel invasion or extrahepatic spread, uh, this match adjusted indirect comparison or make analysis showed um, similar overall survival, a trend towards slightly higher survival in the cabozantinib second line population by comparison to what was seen in the com combination of the second plus third line population with median overall survival in the matched analysis of 11.3 months. Um, and in, in the regorafenib matched population, 10.29 months. Again, these were statistically not significantly different. Looking to the secondary endpoint of both trials of progression free survival. The second line cabozantinib uh, population showed a PFS or a median PFS of 5.5 months uh, by comparison with 3.39 months for regorafenib. Again, though, with the attendant caveats of this being an indirect comparison and, and not possible to truly compare side by side due to cross study uh, differences. Rates of diarrhea in this matched analysis were higher for cabozantinib, another important consideration when choosing therapies. So turning to the next um, class of second-line option, the anti-angiogenic monoclonal agent antibody agent ramucirumab. Here is a Kaplan-Meier overall survival curve from the REACH-2 trial. Um, the REACH-2 trial is an important study in that it is the first trial to look at a biomarker uh, for selection of patients for treatment in advanced hepatocellular carcinoma. And the biomarker in this case was the serum um, circulating protein alpha feta protein. This is based on a prior study entitled REACH-1 or just REACH in which patients um, were not selected for alpha feta protein and ramucirumab was compared to placebo in an unselected population. In that study, the overall trial was negative. There was no significant survival benefit, but subgroup analyses showed a very strong and significant um, finding that uh, patients with elevated alpha feta protein, particularly those with a level greater than or equal to 400 nanograms per milliliter at the start of therapy, did show a significant benefit with respect to overall survival as well as secondary endpoints with ramucirumab. And this signal was strong enough to prompt the ensuing REACH-2 trial, which again is shown here with this Kaplan-Meier curve, um, in patients selected for the presence of baseline alpha feta protein greater than 400 nanograms per milliliter at enrollment. And with that selection, um, the trial showed a significant survival benefit with median overall survival of 8.1 months for ramucirumab by comparison to 5.0 months for placebo. Um, with a hazard ratio of 0 0.69. Again, this was in a second line population after progression on prior serafinib, and again in patients selected for baseline alpha feta protein. Um, now, turning back to our patient case, again for the 60, 60 year old gentleman with uh, chronic Hep B and progression after prior serafinib therapy. Um, I've now talked about three of the options, including the two uh, multikinase inhibitors approved in this space, regorafin and cabozantinib, as well as the uh, VEGFR2 targeted monoclonal antibody, ramucirumab. And so when we think about the targeted options in his case, um, one must consider both the adverse event profile and also the, the biomarker alpha feta protein. And um, as we look to the three different options in this targeted space, regorafenib um, probably wouldn't be a good choice for him because he did not tolerate serafinib at the dose of greater than or equal to 400 milligrams per day um, prior to enrollment in the resource trial, which was the eligibility criterion, and thus is um, not uh, an appropriate candidate for regorafenib or potentially higher risk of toxicity. Uh, for ramucirumab, the patient's um, alpha feta protein at this time point was 130 nanograms per milliliter, so less than the cut point of 400 required for enrollment and required for demonstration of benefit to ramucirumab. Um, and that leaves us with cabozantinib, again, the, the other multi-kinase inhibitor. Um, and this 
drug did show benefit across subgroups um, independent of alpha feta protein level and allowed one or two prior lines of therapy and was not dependent on prior dose of serafinib. And so I think from the three targeted th therapy options shown here, cabozantinib would be best supported by the data as a choice of therapy in this case for second line. Um, but those, uh, again, with the expanding landscape available in HTC, the, the, the story doesn't end there. We actually now have three other um, F US FDA approved regimens to consider, and that's in the immunotherapy space. And so um, I'll, I'll review quickly the data for these three um, agents, nivolumab, pembrolizumab, and the combination of nivolumab with the CTLA-4 inhibitor ipilimumab. So turning first to the monotherapy options, um, nivolumab and pembrolizumab are both PD-1 inhibitor monoclonal antibodies. And both of them received accelerated approvals from the US FDA based upon um, their objective response rate data from single arm phase one and two trials. And for the case of nivolumab, that trial was the, the phase one slash two checkmate 040 cohort uh, treated with nivolumab. And in the case of um, checkmate 040 nivolumab arm, the objective responses, depending on um, whether in the first or second line context and, and the arm of the study, range from 14 to 20% and were quite durable, um, greater than about 10 months or longer, again, depending on the cohort um, being examined. And so the, the depth and durability of these responses led to nivolumab approval by the US FDA in uh, 2017 as the first immunotherapy agent uh, available in, in the second or greater line setting for, for hepatocellular carcinoma advanced disease after progression on serafinib. Now I must add also that this Checkmate 040 trial was also crucial in establishing the safety of single agent PD-1 inhibition as monotherapy in the hepatocellular carcinoma space, noting that patients with HCC have underlying liver disease, commonly hepatitis B virus or hepatitis C virus, or uh, other causes of fibrosis or cirrhosis, as Rich alluded to in the earlier section. And I think one of the, the key points that was established by um, first the Checkmate 040 and later the ensuing studies was the rates of immune-related hepatitis or hepatic decompensation have been quite low, generally less than 5% across monotherapy trials with a, a small subsets of patients requiring immunosuppression for immune hepatitis or, or hepatobiliary complications. And so again, this was a very reassuring uh, finding that established the initial role of, of nivolumab first in, in the advanced HEC after progression. Now, subsequently, as, as Rich also has shown, nivolumab has been studied in the first line space in the Checkmate 459 trial by comparison with serafinib. Um, this trial was negative, uh, meaning that nivolumab did not show superiority for overall survival by comparison with serafinib in a first-line population, but did again show objective responses occurring in, in around 15% or higher of patients that were again durable and with acceptable safety, solidifying the, the early stage uh, data that we have from Checkmate 040. Pembrolizumab has a very similar story, um, another PD-1 inhibitor that showed um, deep and durable responses in about 17% of patients enrolled in the phase two single arm keynote 224 um, trial. And uh, the duration of response was actually not reached in that trial because they were so long, long standing. This trial prompt, the Keynote 224 trial prompted the follow-up trial phase three Keynote 240 in the second line context of pembrolizumab versus placebo and did show a trend towards benefit in all um, endpoints, including overall survival, uh, progression-free survival, and objective response rate, but um, owing to potentially um, underpowering and uh, impact of crossover, as well as some other statistical factors of the design, did not meet statistical significance. Nonetheless, um, based on the strength of the single arm data, as well as the data from 240, pembrolizumab is also approved as a second line agent after progression on first line therapy in HCC. Now, again, we have an expanding landscape to address and multiple options that are really quite exciting. And so turning back um, to the trial I mentioned earlier, the phase one, two, checkmate 040 trial, which first introduced us to nivolumab and HCC, you can see that that trial grew to include multiple downstream arms. And the arm I'd like to focus on here is the combination of nivolumab plus ipilimumab. Again, um, nivolumab is the PD-1 inhibitor. Ipilimumab is a CTLA-4 inhibitor monoclonal antibody. And in that cohort of nivolumab plus 
um, ipilimumab. Three different dosing uh, schedules were investigated. Uh, nivolumab, one milligram per kilogram, um, plus ipilimumab, three milligram per kilogram combination, arm A. And Nevo, three, IPB1, sort of the inverse option for arm B. And then um, a, a Nevo, uh, three, two week, plus IPB1 every six weeks, sort of different schedule options. So all three of these were um, treated with randomization. Um, in patients with advanced HCC and progression after prior serafinib, so a second line population and uh, adequate um, child PUA liver function. So here are the top line results from the nivolumab plus ipilimumab cohort in Checkmate 040. And we can see here some um, striking objective response rates range uh, about 30 to uh, 31 to 32 percent across the three different dosing schedules, which were all quite durable and accompanied by. Um, quite impressive median overall survival for a second line population. Now again, the caveat is that this is an uncontrolled study with relatively small sample sizes, about 50 patients per arm. And another important consideration is toxicity. And I think um, it will show that uh, it bears a t drawing your attention to the rates of um, grade three or higher transaminitis, particularly in the higher dose ipilimumab arm A, and the requirement for corticosteroids, which was um, as high as 51% in arm A. Um, nonetheless, um, based on the strength of efficacy um, shown from this Checkmate 040 cohort, um, the US FDA did approve um, nivolumab plus ipilimumab as another option after progression on serafinib. And so before closing and finishing with our case, um, I think it's very important in the field for us to, to realize that um, I think historically we all expected that patients maybe could receive one or two lines of therapy at most, and for years we only had serafinib to treat our patients in the oncologic advanced space. But when we look to modern trials, we realize that that's really changing, and that, that not only the expanding treatment options, but potentially the expansion to earlier stages of disease based on efficacy in advanced space is really letting patients receive multiple lines of therapy and have multiple chances to benefit. So if we look at the Checkmate 459 trial of nivolumab versus serafinib, um, we see that uh, about half of patients in both arms went on to receive second line therapy. Um, and, and when we look in the second line randomized trial, Keynote 240, again, we see uh, over 40% of patients in both arms, both Pembro and placebo going on to receive third line therapy. And so I think, um, again, this emphasizes the importance of having multiple drugs and lines of therapy to work with and understanding how best to sequence and choose for an individual patient. So returning back to the case, uh, to conclude here, um, in our patient who had progressed after serafinib with dose reductions on serafinib, how do we choose, how do we decide whom to give immunotherapy versus one of the targeted agents we discuss discussed earlier? Um, I think now that, as we discussed with the atezolizumab, bevacizumab context and after Rich's presentation in the first line, um, it is, I think, emphasizes the role of immunotherapy and we, leads us to consider an immunotherapy combination earlier on in the second line, perhaps, rather than a TKI, for example, in a patient who didn't receive a tezobab first line. So if a patient received lenvatinib or serafinib first line for whatever reason, but as an immunotherapy candidate, that's a patient, if they are fit, uh, may be appropriate for receiving nivolumab or the combination of nivolumab plus ipilimumab in the second line. Likewise, I'm inclined to think of immunotherapy in the second line in patients who had rapid progression or rapid intolerance to, for example, prohibitive hypertension um, for um, on a tyrosine kinase inhibitor in the first line of therapy, or even on bevacizumab if patients had contraindications to antiangiogenic therapy such as bleeding or blood clots or uh, re refractory malignant hypertension, that's a patient where immunotherapy may be a, a, the right choice immediately in the second line. Um, in this context, this is uh, well beyond the scope of just one talk, but it is important also to note um, that nivolumab has been studied in a child pew B cohort, uh, shown briefly in that uh, Checkmate 40 uh, schema. There, have, there is prospective data reassuring us that the immunotherapy safety in, of nivolumab in child pew B patients is acceptable and is an option to consider. Um, and with that, I think I'll turn to Dr. Finn to see if there are audience questions. Thank you very much for that great overview, Katie. And, and maybe for the sake of time, I'll just have you address these questions too that came in. Uh, somewhat similar to the issue of new data, right? Uh, you know, this question is about what's optimal second line treatment for a patient who progressed on lenvantinib. And I think that's based on the context that all the studies that have read out have been on prior serafinib. Does prior lenvantinib change your decision tree? 
Great question. I think, uh, well, of course, we'd like to have uh, randomized level one evidence in terms of clinical trials to study the sequence. Not That is not really feasible. Certainly, we don't have that data now, and it may not be feasible in the future, certainly not right away. So I think for a patient that had um, rapid progression or a combination of progression and, and intolerance on a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, I'd be more inclined to use either a immunotherapy checkpoint inhibitor as monotherapy or the nivolumab plus ipilimumab regimen if, if it's a very fit patient able to um, weather the toxicity potential of the nevo ipi regimen. On the converse, if a patient had really prolonged benefit to a tyrosine kinase inhibitor and suggests an anti-angiogenic responsive tumor, I might be inclined to use a drug like cabozantinib, which has been used after um, second or third line therapy in, in multiple types of different uh, first and second line therapies. Um, based on the premise that an anti-angiogenic t- sensitive tumor uh, may respond better to a, a, mul- a multi-kinase inhibitor with additional targets such as MET. And, and certainly if they had a high AFP, uh, ramucirumab, which has a, a very, Absolutely. very good Absolutely. safety profile might be an option. So the big challenge, I think, in all of cancer medicine is what to do after progression on IOs, right? And uh, as IO moves front line, such as with the Tezo and Bev, do you see a role for Nevo Ipi uh, as second line? Is is there some rationale for that, or what's your thought? Great question. I think we have some precedent from melanoma of using uh, adding a CTLA four inhibitor at some point after progression on a, a an earlier regimen of PD one or uh, PDL one. I think we don't have data like that yet in HCC. Um, but certainly in a fit patient without other treatment options to try, I, I would consider um, potentially after trying a tyrosine kinase inhibitor first, though. Great. So we are uh, moving right along, uh, and I will introduce uh, Laura, who's going to talk about our approach across the HCC continuum, not just advanced stage. So Laura, please take it away as the hour winds down. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rich. So the, our patient third case is a 59-year-old gentleman with NASH who is compensated cirrhosis, who was found to have an incidence of liver mass on its surveillance. This was a 6.5 centimeter lesion that was consistent with HCC by radiographic findings, LRADS 5, with two satellite nodules. There was no vascular invasion or evidence of metastatic disease. He was well compensated, bilirubin 0.9, albumin 3.9, INR 1, and had an ECOG performance status of zero. So this patient falls uh, squarely into the BCLC stage B. Uh, this is a picture that is taken from the WSLD guidance, which takes into account the not only the stage, but the level of evidence in terms of treatment options. We know that TACE has been the backbone of the treatment for patients with intermittent HCC based on level 1 data. However, radioembolization, or TAR, uh, has level 2 data su- to support its use. This is a non-randomized study uh, under the direction of Dr. Kudo that specifically looked at patients in the intermediate stage. However, we know that this is a very heterogeneous group of patients. So he specifically took patients who were beyond up to seven criteria, which takes into account the largest size of the tumor plus the number of lesions. These patients were all well compensated at Child's Pew A, and patients received lumbatinib or chemoembolization. They did propensity matching, and they found that patients who received lumbatinib up front had a median overall survival that was significantly higher compared to TACE at 37.9 months compared to 21.3 months. So this study was thought-provoking in the use of lumbatinib or systemic therapy up front as opposed to chemoembolization in patients with a tumor burden that is beyond up to 7. So what is the rationale for moving TKIs earlier into the schema? Um, This would be to try to prevent tumor progression, to delay the onset of portal vein invasion or extra PAC disease with the hope of uh, improving overall survival. And we know that the mechanism of TKIs can decrease angiogenesis. We've heard multiple times that there can be changes by immunomodulation. The TKIs might take a cold tumor and transform this into a hot tumor with improved sensitivity to immunotherapy. 
However, there have been multiple large randomized controlled trials that have looked at the combination of chemoembolization with a TKI, and unfortunately, these all failed and were negative trials, and there have been multiple reasons as to why this could have occurred. And very recently, a phase two trial known as TACTICS was conducted in Japan, and it showed a significant improved PFS at 25 months compared to 13 months in patients who received combination with taste plus serafinib versus taste alone. And part of these findings may be how this trial was designed. Patients were allowed to remain on their selected uh, treatment modality that they were randomized to despite new liver lesions. And this is uh, different compared to what these other trials um, had been how they were conducted. And because of this, in the tactics trial, patients were on serafinib for a longer period of time compared to these historical phase three trials that were negative. More recently, tactics reported there was an improvement in macrovascular, uh, free, mas free of macrovascular invasion overall survival, as well as uh, free of development of metastatic disease overall survival. So again, this is a, a thought-provoking trial. Recently at ASCO, there was a readout uh, from interim analysis of the LANCE trial. This is a uh, prospective multi-center uh, trial that is looking at adjuvant therapy in patients who have undergone resection and are considered at high risk of relapse. Uh, this was defined as the presence of macro or microvascular invasion, a lesion up to eight, uh, exceeding eight centimeters or greater than three lesions. And patients received either lumbatinib plus TACE as combination therapy or TACE alone. And they found that the median uh, DFS was significantly longer at 12 months in the combination arm compared to the TACE arm, which was eight months. And importantly, the side effects that were seen when uh, combining a TKI with uh, chemoembolization were what we would expect as a class effect associated with the TKIs of hypertension and diarrhea and no increase in concerns for safety. So the next wave of therapy uh, we expect to see is the combination of local regional therapy with immunotherapy. And one of the first trials that reported this was looking at patients who were BCLC B or C, and they received sublethal uh, treatment with RFA or chemoembolization followed by a CTL4 uh, antibody. And what they found is that they were able to biopsy lesions that had not undergone local regional therapy, and they found there was an increase in CD8 cells, showing that there is a possible scopal effect that the use of local regional therapy may release tumor antigens that then allow the immunotherapy to be more efficacious. With that, there are multiple ongoing trials that are looking at the combination of immunotherapy with local regional therapy. Some of these um, are the, the, the comparator is TASE plus placebo in all of them. And you can see that there are combinations with two uh, IOs versus TKIs. Um, <clears throat> and we will wait to see what the results of this. It's important to note that child's pew was important uh, in being a child's pew A. Um, or up to B7. So returning to our patient who is a well-compensated gentleman with BCLCB, what are the options? There are local regional therapies versus enrolling this patient in a clinical trial that is looking at multimodality combination of local regional therapy with immunotherapy or TKIs. So that was great, Laura. A lot of information in a relatively short period of time. But really, the intermediate group of patients is maybe the largest presentation of patients. And, and again, it speaks to the fact that patients are probably best served at a uh, multidisciplinary program where they can be parsed into the most appropriate treatment regimens because the patient you just discussed might even be curable, right, with a liver transplant after local regional treatment and being downstaged. But a lot of patients, and this question from the audience uh, reflects this, you know, for this patient case, when would you consider moving them to systemic treatment and what would be your choice, a TKI or IO combo? And, and an important concept that maybe you could speak to, because now we have all these drugs available, you know, when do we stop TACE, right? When has when TACE stopped working? 
And this is a, a, a great question because the, it, it goes to the point that we don't want to overuse local regional therapy to the point that patients decompensate and then they are no longer considered candidates for systemic therapy because the majority of all these systemic therapies have been approved in patients who are child's PUA. Um, so I would say that, you know, based on some of the data that we have seen from Professor Kudo and from Japan, they are trying to really define what is the group of patients that are more likely to become taste refractory or are more likely to not benefit from taste. And some of that has been using the up to seven, which I'll speak to a little bit in uh, my next presentation, um, but also patients who are LB2, patients who have very large lesions, infiltrative disease, poorly differentiated tumors. Those are patients who are probably not going to do quite so well with uh, local regional therapy, and I would consider moving to a uh, a systemic therapy, which one would really depend if, as you had stated, if I was thinking of trying to get this patient to transplant, I would be more likely to use a TKI as opposed to an IO until we have better data on the safety of an IO in the setting of transplantation. Okay, great. And I think uh, you have another case for us. So this is a 56-year-old gentleman with hepatitis B, antenofovir, is compensated. On surveillance, was found to have a liver lesion. This is a 3.3 centimeter Lyrats 5 lesion. Um, he is child's PUA. Uh, we see the LFTs here. Platelet count is normal. ECOG performance status is zero. We are all familiar with the BCLC staging system. This person falls into solitary uh, lesions. So our decision making is, is this person an optimal surgical candidate? If yes, they could become a resection candidate. If not, then we would consider transplantation or potentially ablation, although this lesion is above three centimeters. So I would be concerned about using ablation alone. There are multiple points in terms of hepatic resection. The first point is that that patient, people often think that resection has to be in a lesion less than five centimeters, and this is not true. Uh, resection can be in a solitary lesion regardless of size, but there are many factors that need to be taken into account. Specifically, is there presence of clinically significant portal hypertension? This could be measured looking at the corrective sinusoidal pressure or the HVPG. And if this is 10 or above, this is considered clinically significant portal hypertension and resection should be avoided. Or you can use clinical correlates if there's presence of varices, low platelets, or an enlarged spleen. Also, the bilirubin is important. If the bilirubin is greater than one, this is a concern. And five-year survival is found to be excellent in patients who do not have clinically significant portal hypertension and a bilirubin that is less than, than one. The other concern is what is the future liver remnant? You want to make sure that this person who has underlying cirrhosis 90% of the time is going to have enough liver to sustain them. And in patients with cirrhosis, this should be at least 40%. And this is a nice table that kind of walks through taking into account the presence of portal hypertension, the extent of the resection, as well as the MELD score. So at the extremes, if there is no portal hypertension and there is less than three segments and the MELD score is less than nine, this is a low risk procedure and liver mortality is exceedingly low. However, if there is evidence of portal hypertension and the resection is considered major, then you have a high risk of uh, decompensation and your mortality is 25%, and this is a patient that this should be avoided. The other point is that we currently do not have any approved treatments after resection, and we know that there is a high risk of recurrence because of the underlying cirrhosis that remains. And this brings up the point that transplantation remains the best treatment option for patients with HCC because it removes the cancer as well as the underlying cirrhotic liver. However, there are patients who are beyond the Milan criteria, which is what we use as classification for transplantation, who could be treated with local regional therapy to be successfully downstaged and become transplant candidates. However, the current shortage of organs is something that needs to be kept in mind. Recently, the governing body of transplantation has adopted a downstaging protocol. You will see that there is upper limits of uh, tumor. Um, I just want to point out that up to seven that we have talked about in this downstaging protocol, a patient can have a solitary lesion up to eight centimeters, which does exceed the up to seven. The, so that's something I would keep in mind. Patients who are downstaged with local regional therapy to the Milan criteria are granted a 
uh, meld exception without the need for a special case. If a patient is beyond this protocol, for example, they have a 10 centimeter lesion, you treat them with TACE or Y90 and their lesion is now 4.9 centimeters, they may be able to get exception points but have to uh, receive this as an exception through the National Review Board. There are multiple ongoing studies that are looking at adjuvant immunotherapy in patients who are considered high risk after resection or ablation. Uh, these are highlighted here. And there is an ongoing phase two trial from MD Anderson that is looking at uh, patients prior to resection and patients are randomized to receive either nivolumab alone or nivolumab plus IPI. Patients undergo resection with four, within four cycles of uh, four weeks of the last cycle, and then patients are eligible to continue adjuvant immunotherapy for up to two years. So, going back to our patient, um, this patient underwent a resection. He returns to clinic, um, and one important point that I always go over with the patient when I give them their explant pathology report is that they are at high risk of recurrence because they have underlying cirrhosis. So this patient's options would be to continue active surveillance. I generally do this every three months for about a year to a year and a half, depending on their degree of their risk based on their explant, and then reverting back to six months versus a clinical trial with the use of adjuvant immunotherapy. And lastly, I just want to point out, as Rich has also alluded to, as we have more and more of these drugs that become available to our patients, it is going to be very important that we continue to work as a multidisciplinary team. This is a study that specifically showed that in patients who were uh, presented in a multidisciplinary team, that their overall survivals by stage were, uh, were improved. So as we get more of these agents, it's going to be important that we work together in order to improve the outcomes of our patients. Thank you very much, Laura. We have several audience questions, but we are up against time. Uh, uh, maybe we'll just take one or two. There, there is a question about patients with autoimmune hepatitis and the use of checkpoint inhibitors. I, I, I think I would not do that, uh, given the concern about activating their autoimmune hepatitis. Uh, and then for you, Laura, there was a question about patients who have an incomplete local ablation, uh, or for that matter, incomplete taste. Uh, is there a role for systemic treatment in those patients? I think it depends on who you talk to. So if you talk to an interventional radiologist, uh, there is data that if you've undergone one ablation or one taste that you could deserve a second uh, option with the same modality to see if you can achieve a complete response. Um, but the data that I presented uh, using that, um, they specifically did uh, their treatment, so they did not want to obtain a complete response radiographically by using TACE or uh, ablation, and then added a CTL4 or systemic therapy and found that there was this improvement or this influx of immune cells into tumors that were not even treated. So I think it is beginning to show that the combination of local regional therapy, complete or not complete, with an immunotherapy um, is going to provide better tumor control. So an area of, uh, of unmet need that we'll probably hear more about in the future. So I wanna thank you all for joining us. Uh, patient education is critical. I wanna call your attention to the Blue Ferry, the Adrian Wilson Liver Cancer Association, which is a great patient advocate resource uh, and can be reached at blueferry.org, one of the few dedicated uh, patient advocacy programs for liver cancer. And there are others, including the NCI, uh, the American Liver Foundation, the AASLD, and the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. There are also resources for our current COVID epidemic or pandemic. Uh, hopefully this will all be behind us soon enough. But until then, I call your attention to both the ILCA International Liver Cancer Association website or the ASCO website. So in conclusion, there's a lot going on in liver cancer. Critical is that patients are triaged to the right treatment at the right time, because we now have so many active systemic treatments that these really are maximized when we get patients treated when their liver function is still preserved. And the exciting data with the tezolizumab and bevacizumab in the frontline setting really highlights the importance of getting patients who are well compensated because they can get a frontline option. And then at progression, we heard about so many effective new regimens, including TKIs, uh, 
combination IO agents, combination IO, anti-KIs, and there's so much changing in the liver cancer space. Uh, it's really an exciting time to be in this field. And also keep in mind, clinical trials are pivotal to keep us moving forward. Uh, patients uh, are still not being cured uh, outside of transplant, so it's critical that we try to move these drugs to earlier stage settings, and that is always going to be in the context of studies. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash VBH860. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.